What time did you start this morning? Seven o'clock. Does that mean you have to get up at six o'clock in the morning? Six. Yeah, ten to six. Oh, right. That's quite early, isn't it? And what's your idea of a lion? You know, on a day when you're... Twelve o'clock. Twelve o'clock. I don't know. <laughs> okay. I thought you were going to say half past seven no. or something. No. No. Twelve o'clock. Right at the beginning of the war. I don't know whether anybody will remember the beginning of the war, but... Definitely. We had 50 evacuees. Uh, billeted in our village and we went down into the village hall and picked out who well, mother did picked out who she wanted we had two little girls from London <coughs> and um, they stayed with us that was in 1939 they stayed with us until the war was over and um, Dorian came to Biddeford and that's how she met John and that's how Stephanie and um, Denise <coughs> came along and then there was um, Barbara she was the uh, next to me the eldest she went back to London and became a professional artist and so she paints now for a living mm. me I do absolutely nothing <laughs> <laughs> no, but they were lovely years. <clears throat> we were eight, nine, um, no, we were seven, eight, and nine years old. And we'd go down on our local beach and play every day. And then um, mother would bring down sandwiches for our lunch. And, you know, it would um, make our day really, and then go home. But when the Americans came into the war, two years after the war started, the Americans came into the war and they had a big camp up at Lincoln and they would come down onto the beach every morning and try and practice driving their jeeps up the, up the slopes of the cliff, preparing themselves for D-Day. But... Um, they, they stayed for about four years and then they went and, and we carried on our lives normally. Everybody went home or back to work or whichever. It was a nice period in our lives and I don't think any of us will forget it. <clears throat> because we were young, it stuck in our minds. And if you ask Doreen now, She'll tell you exactly what I've just said. But I I think that, um, you know, that was the, the most um, poignant time of my life, I think. Uh, that's all. Mm. And you don't want me to say any more, do you? <laughs> I mean, I could go on and on. <laughs> if you want to take your mask off or something, just take it off. Oh, yes. Oh, I, just, oh. I just want to move this out of the way. Okay. Oh, I'm having uh, my trousers going for them while I'm doing this. <laughs> They're going! <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, well, Charlie's just lost his trousers! <laughs> Makes a change, I'm not losing mine! <laughs> Mary said things that come back to me from when I was small during the war. I was only a little girl. But there was the army camp, the navy camp, and the, there was a German prisoner of war camp. And they didn't live very, it wasn't very far from where I lived. And there was prisoners of war, they were prisoners of war, the Germans were. And the army camp was guarding them all the time. We couldn't go anywhere. In, near because I we when we were young we used to go apple picking apples where we shouldn't have done we went in <laughs> we went into a farmer's orchard <laughs> and my youngest sister she was in a pram and we used to fill the bottom of the pram up with apples 
Wow. And even a policeman used to come along and he used to say, what are you doing out on this road? Because you weren't allowed to go out on this road because of the German camp. Oh, wow. Mm. Cool. So he said, oh, we've been for a walk. He said, um, oh, people been taking apples from the orchard. But if he didn't but know it, we never told him that we had the apples in the bottom of the farm. <laughs> so it, it was lovely to know. And at Christmas time, the Americans used to bring their wagons to where we used to live and used to pick up every child in the area and take to a Christmas party. And before you came home, they always gave you a present in Christmas paper. And they even had a Father Christmas that none of us believed in when we were young. Because we, I think I used to see my father bring them up and put them <laughs> yeah. in the bottom of the bed. <laughs> but Aww. it was lovely for the Americans. And I mean, I know a lot of girls married Americans in Yeovil. Did they? And they, they were very happy. They had children of their own, you know. And we treated them exactly the same as people treated us. Because they were no different. They were helping us. Mm -hmm. At certain nights... The planes used to come over, the German planes used to come over. Well, we all had to go down into the air raid shelters. But we found out one morning that the aeroplanes was aiming for Westland Aerodrome, where the helicopters was, and there was small planes. That I'm not quite sure what they were. And Instead of hitting the aerodrome, they hit a roll of houses. Every house oh. went to the ground. Mm. Gosh. And well, we were lucky to be alive, to be honest, because the if we'd have stayed in the houses, we would have all been dead. Yeah. But when the London trains came with the refugees, it you had, but before you had refugees, they started at Yeovil. And my father took 200 refugees off. And the refugees was put in people's houses. And the, our next door neighbour, she was what we call a lardy doll. She never had any children. And she had two bedrooms. And then she said, I don't want any children. My father says, you have children. So he gave her a boy and a girl. Gosh. When there was a raid on one night, she came running to my dad and says, I've lost the two children. And my dad said, would you look under the beds and there they were, under the beds that Aww, they were given yeah. to sleep in. And the children were under the beds, she didn't even bother to look for them. <laughs> And they said that they heard the planes coming over and they heard the siren go. Because we used to have a siren at the top of our road. Ray knows one of the girls that, that was a refugee that married one of his friends sons. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, amazing. And they, uh, her name was Molly for one reason. <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't me. <laughs> oh. Well, I'll never forget the war. No. Never. No. Because I had five brothers that went out. I know they were in France. They all came home alive. But I had four uncles that went out and not one of them came back. But for some reason my brothers came home and they were safe. 
And I mean, everybody used to see their family come home. You know, the street parties that we used to have when they came home. Yeah. And we used to really like it. No, my brothers told me what was happening across there, you know, and I mean, they saw people, arms blown off, legs blown off, and the nurses that looked after them, they must have been wonderful. Any nurse that was doing things like that, I think they were marvellous. A plane went down up at Buckland, well that's where Frank was born and that was all Polish people and they they were all killed and Polish people still come every year to put flowers on the stone that they had built in the wood. So I'd like to tell a story of when I first met Stephanie and, uh, and Neil and how it was. Sorry? I said, I'll give you interest. All oh, right. <laughs> uh, and how it was, was I was in, in Tiverton and I was busking, playing the clarinet, busking, and they walked past. No, I didn't notice them particularly, but apparently they stood and listened for a bit and then came back and spoke to me and they said they had a care home and everything. There we are. So that's how I first met Stephanie and Neil. Well, when I was about nine years old, Sunday mornings, we used to, the carpenter used to live beside of the school, an undertaker, mm -hmm. and he used to live beside of the school, and very often we used to go down through there, down through the woods, walk through the woods, and come out in Stapley, you know, back around the roads. Well, one morning, uh, Jeffrey Burry's grandfather, he stopped us, and he said, they're going to make an announcement in a minute, about the start of the war, I thought it was going to start the war. He said, come in. So we stood at the table, he had a t table with a real old um, fretwork type of radio. And we listened to that, and uh, we're now at war with Germany, and that was Chamberlain. But right beside the school up here, and between the school and the farm, it was only about well, 300, 400 yards, and uh, then they built an army camp right there, but we had a triangle around the farm entrance. And that used to be, um, well, later on, but it started off with the Somerset soldiers who were training, and they were put there to start the camp. Do you know, start the camp, and they had to clear off well, about 20 acres of old trumps and trees, and but it was level fields. Mm. You know, but when they were, um, mechanical means much, but the Warwickshire Regiment came, and there was about 500 soldiers came then, but they had any amount of army vehicles, but the hedges were high, the roads were narrow, there was ditches to the side, and there was a great beach hedges all the way around, everywhere was a great beach hedge, where well, they used to park the vehicles underneath there, so, so uh, no aircraft could see them, and then through the road up towards Church and Ford, that main road through there, that... Those ditches, Wimpers was hauling uh, rubble and things like that and filling up those ditches for the great parking areas for the lorries because there was like, about 500 lorries parked through that because the ditches was what? Oh, four foot deep, I expect, and wide. Oh, right. There's either side, and that was equal to the width of the road. Right, yeah. But then they used to park the vehicles, well, from Red Lane, Smeethart, right the way to Red Lane, mm. to Tricky Warren, there was, I don't know, Hundreds of parts along the, uh, the beach hedges where the aeroplanes wouldn't, couldn't see them. Yeah, yeah. It was building the camp bigger and bigger until eventually <laughs> there's some. Um, well, that army huts was being put up, you know, the government army huts. Mm. But I remember later on, when I was about 11, 12, 11 year old, I suppose, uh, the American Thanksgiving Day, we were all. Well, the army camp was just. Well, about 200 yards away from the farm, actually. And the school was invited out there. They'd give us a meal of all different sorts of things. But in this plate were several divisions. And different things was in this division. You know, different things. 
and uh, well, that's what we'd never seen before. Mm. And uh, they would always give them a present and also a bag of uh, coloured marbles, glass yeah. marbles. <laughs> and uh, well, they built the Smith Art Tricky Warren area room, first of all. And then there, there was um, Hurricanes there at the first place. And that was um, Polish pilots. And then it was Spitfires. Mm. And uh, all the fighter planes was there. Well, then at Smith Hart, you know, just the other side, there was the Dakotas was up there. And they used to, um, well, when they take off, they, just before D-Day, the gliders, mm. they would take off and they'd be just, well... Just skimming the hedges, cl- mm. climbing, but they weren't content with one. They took two, and then just before D Day, they were taking three, mm. one two at each side, you know, one at each side, one in the middle. And, and the roads around here was all one way. You could go in one way and out another, but you had a set. You had to have a sentry, H N, an identity card. The soldiers, when there's time off, used to love to go around the fields. Um, Shooting the rabbits, or otherwise called rabbiting. They just love rabbits. That's what I do. That's what I was in the choir in the church. Are you? Well, there was a lot of them in the choir. But that's back a long time ago. Well, can't remember none of it. No, we had the vicar, he, he used to have us out mm-hmm. and talk uh, one place and the other. Well, then Smith and Airdrum was built, then Dunsel was built. It wasn't a quiet minute anywhere. Mm-hmm. And then in the nights, well, around about nine o'clock onwards, you'd hear the old German planes going... Mm-hmm. And that, and they were going. You could see them going over, and they went to Wales and Bristol, in the southwest. You could see them travelling in that direction, mm. and uh, well, they was going for a room. Well, they and then there was landmines dropped. Well, one was dropped in the road, well, less than a quarter mile away from us one night, and then another couple of bit further on. Never a dull moment really. But then we had <coughs> the German prisoners of war. Well, all sorts of prisoners of war, and they used to go down the farms to work. And uh, now, with that, there's an aerodrome with Dunstall, they seem to keep a lot of the prisoners, you know, prisoners of war. Did you meet any prisoners? <coughs> hmm? Oh, yeah. yeah. They used to mix amongst us, and when we were haymaking and things like that, they, I know that was all done back in by hand, mm. but they would come in in the evening or time off, you'd probably get about half a dozen come in helping with the things and doing doing farm work for something to do. When when you look back at it, it looks good. Oh no. Hey Mary. <laughs> yeah, I'm on there. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. How's the new pet dog? Beautiful. Yeah. Lovely. Lover. All time comes to life. Yeah. <laughs> <Nice one. laughs> oh, that's good. Yeah. It started off with doing a choir here with the staff mainly, uh, and then since then it's been all oh, kinds okay. of things: a choir, music for everybody, and, and now we're on to filming. Another thing, I'm glad that I'm here. Mm-hmm. Yes, indeed. There's tons, tons more I could say, but we'll. <laughs>